So, obviously, we want to talk about security and scalability from a Kubernetes point of view. Um, I'm Michael Cade. I'm a technologist or field CTO that reports up into the Veeam CTO. If you know Veeam, our focus is around data protection, whether it be virtual machines, in the cloud, basically looking after your data. From this session point of view, we're going to be focused on uh, Kasten. Kasten is backup for Kubernetes or data management for Kubernetes. So we're going to get into some of the, the new stuff that we've been doing, um, as well as a little bit of a look at the, uh, at the, uh, the current state of affairs when it comes to Kubernetes. I'm joined with Mark. Um, Mark's going to touch on some of the multi-cluster stuff later on in the, in the session. But Mark, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name's Mark Severson. I am a member of technical staff at Kasten. I've been with Kasten for about four years, coming up on four years here. And I was the technical lead for all of our multi-cluster integrations. Cool. OK, so from, a, from an agenda point of view, just some of the things that we want to tick off over the next 58 minutes now is really the state of Kubernetes. How many people are running Kubernetes in their, in their environments? I imagine a lot if we're, if we're coming here. So then I want to give a bit of an overview of what Casting K10 is, what it does, how it can help. How, what the responsibility model looks like as well. Um, then we're going to get into some of that data security. What does data security mean? And some of the stuff that we've d built and integrated with across the, across the ecosystem. Um, and then the next thing is around freedom. Now, freedom being the mobility of your application, whether it be Red Hat OpenShift or um, Rosa within, within AWS, whether it be EKS, whether it be on-premises, Kubernetes clusters, and you're looking to get into EKS because of that, that management plane and everything they have. And then the final thing that we want to cover is around that recovery. And throughout that, there's three, three themes that we want to cover. But really, I want to focus on security around that data and also the scalability of what we're seeing out there in the field. So the state of Kubernetes, and I'm not going to pretend that like, this isn't our data. This comes from um, a Datadog report. There is actually a new one come out, and you just see an increased number of stateful workloads that live and breathe inside of your Kubernetes cluster. I'm going to also touch on cloud-native deployment patterns, where we've had that long-standing conversation around stateless versus stateful. I'm not going to bring that up here, but there's different options around where we run our, our state. So generally speaking, we're going to have some sort of data service somewhere, whether it's a message queue, a database, or some sort of data service storing some important data somewhere, um, whether it's a PVC or whether it's out in the using RDS or as an example. Um, so we're definitely going to touch on some of that as we get through the mobility and actually looking at the whole application from that, that perspective. So one of the things that we see, we see three different deployment patterns out there in the wild. And I'm, I'm sure most of you can relate to this, is you're either using your application, maybe it is stateless in, in Kubernetes, but then it's connecting somehow to a, an external PaaS service, such as Amazon RDS, Postgres, Aurora, et cetera. And that's the, that's the tie-in to, to that stateful data still needs to be protected is really the key takeaway, the shared responsibility of that. Then we're also seeing some infrastructure Kubernetes clusters that maybe just hold all of the important infrastructure services, such as things like Argo CD or GitOps type pipelines but equally around our storage again. So we might have a dedicated cluster that is just there to provide storage services or data services to another application development cluster, for example. And then, or we go the operator model and we throw everything into the same cluster and we have pers uh, yeah, persistent volume claims, stateful sets, operator model um, of, uh, of uh, storing that data inside of that. So casting K10. Casting K10 is focused on protecting work, workloads, applications within your Kubernetes cluster. So a reverse roadmap of this is around um, our, how we've evolved over the last um, X amount of releases. We tend to release around the big milestones, KubeCon in Europe, KubeCon in America, that was a couple of weeks ago. And you see that trend around security and scale is really what I want to cover here today. But it's a, also important that this isn't, we've not just thought of this overnight, we've been looking at security and scale for the last several releases as well, as well as understanding that where our swim lane is in terms of our responsibility. We're not a security company, we're going to integrate into the best of breed security ecosystem 
um, integrations out there, and I'll get on to, to some of those as we, as we go through this. Those three things, if there's three things I'd like you to all walk away with today uh, as to what K10 is focused on, one is data security, one is data freedom, and one is data recovery. So security being, we're gonna store that data. Generally speaking, if something bad happens, whether it is malicious acts from cyber threats, whether it is accidental deletion, dropping of tables, changing stuff in our data service, ultimately we're, we're that right of the bang, whatever that bang is, and that's the remediation. How can we get you back as fast as possible? But how do we give you visibility and, and all of that good stuff to get you, get you back? And that's where then the freedom comes in because I wanna be able to potentially restore that, that, what, that workload, that application, wherever it needs to be. So if that is in EKS, if that's in Rosa, if that's on premises, if that's using EKS anywhere, great. I wanna be able to leverage all options. I don't wanna be tied in to any particular location to recover from. So being agnostic to, to where that needs to be. Then from a recovery point of view, I need to be able to bring back either all of my application and all of the artifacts that go with that, but I also might just need the PVC or I might just need the, the application metadata, the configuration YAML. I kind of just touched on that. There's a lot of slides in here that I wanted to keep because after, after the fact, after the session, they'll be made available so that you can still go through and, and go into a little bit more detail. Now, what makes Kasten unique and why we can't really in the Kubernetes world, we can't be using traditional image-based backup type tools like Veeam backup and replication is because it's a, it's a very different ecosystem. Kubernetes native, we wanna be able to understand and speak or become part of the Kubernetes API. We wanna be able to shift left and provide that autonomous way of being able to operate our data protection. So as K10 is de deployed within your Kubernetes cluster and it's per cluster deployment, we become part of the Kubernetes API. We're, we're a set of custom resources, but also ap aggregated APIs that, that um, we become part of that Kubernetes API. So it's native, equally it's agnostic to, to, uh, to wherever. So that brings in that freedom of choice. Security is obviously a focus around things like ransomware detection, but then equally being able to leverage immutability, object lock API within S3 as to where we're gonna store that data, but also understanding if something's trying to tamper with those because cyber or ransomware threats are tend to, they, they tend to be focused on um, attacking the, the backup data as well. Uh, the other thing on there is around consistency. So, Databases, they don't like the, the, the figurative um, power plug being, being pulled out, yanked out midway through transactions. I'm sure there's some DBAs in the, in the room. So we have to think about consistency at that point. So being able to provide applica full application consistency is a, is a key part of that. It's all well and good on a, on a little demo, pulling the plug, but on a mission critical database or data service, we need to consider consistency across the whole application and that might span from your Kubernetes cluster up into RDS, like I mentioned, it, that the whole application is, is what we're talking about here. From a security point of view, as I mentioned, um, the ransomware protection, so early detection if something's trying to tamper with our backups, but equally, we know that that last line of defense, that backup is stored in an immutable fashion, and we can get you back up and running if, if the worst was to, was to happen. Also being able to integrate into your, the ecosystem integrations that I touched on. I'm gonna to touch on um, one in particular that we, we just released around an integration with Datadog, so from a scene point of view. And again, getting those early signs that something bad might be happening. Let's, let's dive into that. Then some other things around secure operations, cross-functional compliance. How do we um, hook into tools like OPA and Kyverno to set guardrails, policy as code, to make sure that if we're deploying an application that has some sort of state, then I want to ensure that we have at least some sort of catch-all backup on that. So we can be pragmatic and automate those, those backup creation. Now, I'm going to demo this, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but ultimately we have two ways of, of, of being able to integrate into, into Datadog. One is we, we send, we, we leverage the, the audit logs natively within Kubernetes, and we can send them off to one of our location profiles, so an S3 bucket, for example, but then we can also send it directly into Datadog as a SaaS 
SaaS provider, and that's going to trigger, or it's going to give us that, that um, functional notification to say something, something bad's potentially happening. But I'm going to show that as we, as we get through. From a Kubernetes ransomware protection, I've kind of touched on this, is how do we, how do we isolate those backups from, uh, from um, attacked? Providing things like immutability, object lock APIs, et cetera, is, is how we do that. The ransomware detection, especially if we're looking at, at um, uh, Red Hat on, on AWS, Rosa, then we integrate into uh, the Red Hat ACS and the Amazon Guard Duty as well. So again, we're not, we're not building our own tools. We're going to use the best ones that are available to us in the ecosystem for that. I mentioned around policy as code and setting those guardrails in place with Kyverno and, and OPA. This is just an example of us making sure that we set those policies in place so that if your developers are deploying applications with state, we can confirm that you can't run that unless, it, unless it's being protected or it's being sent out to a, an object storage location. We've done quite a lot of work around the NIST framework. That's in general across Veeam, so around identifying what our build, build image, what our supply chain security looks like, the application discovery from that. The protection is obviously a massive part from what we're doing. We're protecting that data. As we become part of that Kubernetes API, we, we can take advantage of Kubernetes RBAC as well that's built in, so we can leverage that. But equally, we've built authentication models into Okta and other, other authentication and authorization tools within that, the policy guardrails that I mentioned. The detection, so things like I want to know if someone's trying to delete versions out of my S3 bucket. I want to know that so that I can be notified of that so I can go and investigate why and how did someone get access into my, into my account. Then responding, how do, we, how do we define what those logs look like and what's important to us and what's not? So we've spent a lot of time on that development. And clearly, backup's, backup's great, but it's the recovery that everyone really needs. When bad things happen, we need to be able to bring that back as fast as possible. So we have a few ways in which I mentioned around granular restore, so being able to say, I need this PVC, I don't need that one, that one is fine, um, and be very granular about how we recover, recover those workloads. Also, disaster recovery, a big part of what we, what we have within the product is a, the ability to send those backups to a different cluster, region, location, and have them synced so that you can hit that button and everything comes up in that, that secondary location. And we've thought about it from a, a development point of view all the way through to the deployment. So development, making sure obviously our supply chain is secure, what we're doing, adding those policy guardrails again, authentication models, whether it be AWS access management and integrating into that. So you're not having to go and roll your own again, like no one wants to do that, you already invested a lot of time and effort with those. So, yeah, um, and then from an operations point of view, like I mentioned, role-based access control, least privilege model, all of that good stuff, and then having that audit tell me that trail of bad things or when there's potentially things I need to go and look at. On that, so continuously auditing, having that, that, um, that policy as code, understanding when bad things are happening, having that visibility around that security. Ops point of view, we integrate into Prometheus and Grafana, actually, when you deploy Casting K10, we deploy our own um, Prometheus and, and Grafana to give you visibility and observability of, of um, Kasten and our operations. We can't, if you've already invested a lot of time and you've deployed your own Prometheus or Grafana, we can also go into that. Um, and then also looking at what does that experience look like? Because a lot of our workloads are now automated. We're leveraging tools like Argo CD from a GitOps point of view, so how do we integrate back up into that? Again, because we're part of that Kubernetes API, we have the ability to, to integrate into that, that CD pipeline from that perspective. Okay, I appreciate that you've seen a lot of slides already this week and already for the last um, 15 minutes, so let's get to the, the demo. And the first demo that I wanna show is a short demo around, we've got an EKS cluster in US East, one or two, and we're sending those audit logs in fact, I'm going to show you both sending the audit log into, into S3 and then directly into, into, um, into data, Datadog as well. So fingers crossed. So what I, what I start with is deploying the agent within our Kubernetes cluster, the Datadog agent. And hopefully that's playing, yeah. 
So this is casting K10. So as you can see, we have a, a, a UI, but you can integrate, inter, interact with it through um, the CLI and the Kubernetes API as well. We're going to use this. Um, so the, the, uh, the, the Datadog agent is what connects us or connects any application integration they have into their Datadog SaaS. The, the second bit that I did there was um, also the, the location profile. So where are we going to send those audit logs off into an Amazon S3 um, bucket? And then we're going to see both of them in our Datadog environment. But really, you're only going to use one. But for the purpose of the demo, I wanted to show that we have choice when it comes to that. You also saw that when new things land in that S3 bucket, there's a Lambda function that goes out and, and scrapes that and then sends that directly into, into our Datadog as well. So from a detection rules point of view, if I search for casting in here, I have three, three that have been created. And I basically want to understand if anything's been modified within my cluster. Anyone's trying to delete any of my retention or my backup or my restore points is really what I want to understand. I want to understand the, the critical if anyone's trying to get rid of cluster restore points or recovery points for my application. And I want to see that either in, I want to be notified in a particular particular way is really what this, this is summarizing. And uh, anyone that's used Datadog, this is a, and if this, then that type, type scenario, right? We're, we're showing what, what does a detection result actually look like? Where do you want it to send? What do you want it to do if something is found? So if I then go through and I'm storing my backups in an S3 um, repository and I have versioning and I have object lock API, but let's say that I've gained access into my Amazon account uh, or as a bad, bad person, malicious activity, you can see that I've set that up to hit my Slack channel. So our SIRE team, our platform engineering team, whoever has that data responsibility now can go and act upon this. That looks strange. What's going on? Now, I know that my backups are safe because they're using that versioning and that object lock API, but I can, I'm can i now aware that maybe someone is trying to tamper with stuff, so I need to go and find that. I need to go and prevent any more malicious activity from that. So I'm safe because I'm sending my backup data into my immutable S3, S3 bucket. So that's the first demo. The second one is a little bit more interesting, and we're seeing um, more and more people, like I mentioned, around the application lives in your Kubernetes cluster, and it's connecting to a PaaS-based service such as Amazon RDS. And or we're seeing people with that stateful set and wanting to move that stateful set into a PaaS-based service. And both of them are valid options, right? The, the storage scene from a Kubernetes point of view over the last, I would say, last three, four years, has become a lot more apparent that it's fine to store storage or data within our Kubernetes cluster. The CSI kind of leapfrogged or, or accelerated that capability of being able to store that important data alongside our application for speed um, and control as well. Because when you go to RDS, it's hitting the easy button and you're paying the premium for it to be looked after, but it's not right next to your, well, it potentially isn't right next to your, to your cluster. So what we mean by Mobility is the ability to send it, send our application plus its data from one place to another. So if that is from Red Hat OpenShift to um, EKS or EKS Anywhere to Rosa um, or any Kubernetes cluster for that matter, but then equally around the data service as well. So if I have a Postgres database that is a stateful set within my Kubernetes cluster and I need to just get that into RDS, then we, we provide the ability to do that and I'll show that in a, in a demo shortly as well. Some of the reasons why we need that mobility, right? Things like I want to transform what that application looks like. And yes, we can do that from source code and we can do that from our Helm charts and we can do that from a deployment. But and we can do that with a GitOps model with Argo CD, for example, um, deploying our application. However, GitOps or Argo CD is not, it's not aware of a Postgres database. So if you make a bad change through your GitOps pipeline, then you're potentially forgetting about the, the data and the database. Source code doesn't know anything about the data in the database. Also, things like cluster upgrades, we get three releases of Kubernetes a year. So how do we, how do we, handle, how, how do we handle that? It's probably actually easier just to invoke new clusters and, and, go, and go again. Um, but equally, how do we leverage that data? How can I provide, okay, production's great and production's working, 
how do I take a copy of that data and be able to provide it to a development clusters with next to, next to new um, data? So we have the ability to restore that everywhere or anywhere, um, and that, that is the application itself plus the persistent volume claim or the data, the PaaS-based data service. I'm gonna to touch on what and how we do that. So all of the artifacts basically that build up that, that application, so all of your, all of your uh, your amazing YAML in your Kubernetes clusters. What we also have is this ability to transform what that application looks like. So this is basically being able to manipulate anything within those YAML manifests, those artifacts. So if it's a, um, a storage class change from one cluster to another, we can help you migrate those persistent volume claims to a different one. But it also could be things like ingress and other, other changeable um, parts of those artifacts. So. Uh, yeah, ingress being one of those examples on the, on the screenshot. It might be just to scale that deployment. It might be, let, I wanna see what my application looks like with the next version of, of uh, the application in a test and dev type environment. So being able to leverage that data, transform what that needs to look like and, uh, and, and be able to restore that. So um, pretty diagram, cluster A and cluster B. Again, it might be that we're going from a Kubernetes distribution into EKS, OpenShift, et cetera. It doesn't matter, we're agnostic to that. We're software only, we don't, we're not tied to any of the particular storage. CSI is obviously helping us with that because we're seeing a lot more, um, uh, I guess, like commoditization of, of storage. Enterprise storage vendors integrate or they use that CSI path to, to present their storage and we leverage the volume snapshot class and the, the functionality of CSI to be able to um, connect and do something with that, that data. So really what this is, we're exporting that out into our S3 bucket, and then we've got the ability to transform what that looks like on part of that restore into a different cluster is really what this is, what this is showing. But where it gets really interesting is how many people started with their, running their database on, on stateful sets. We're seeing an increase of people wanting to now take advantage of things like RDS and RDS Postgres or, or Aurora. So we've seen that use case, we've seen that want and that, that, that demand. So we, we can leverage our backups that we've been taking for the last however long to then get us into, into um, that PaaS-based service. So hopefully you have a backup if you're running stateful workloads in there, um, and we do, right? Um, so what I want to do is I've got a backup, it's exporting that backup out into my S3 bucket, and I want to take that back up and I want to restore that into, into RDS. So Postgres DB migration into RDS is really what I wanted to show. Now, last year, if anyone came to the session last year or follows or not, uh, has knowledge of Kasten, we already have the ability to protect those workloads as part of that. So if your data is already in RDS, we can protect the whole application, including everything in, in the Kubernetes cluster and the RDS. We have a blueprint that allows us to protect that. Um, it uses a config map, so this is, this is front end production application. We have a config map that connects to our RDS instance and we have a secret that provides the credentials into, into RDS. That's really how our front end application connects into that database, that's nothing we're doing. But I wanna, um, then continue to protect that in the same way I have been for the last however long, whatever that retention looks like. So the demo here is that I've got Postgres, it's a stateful set, and I wanna get that into RDS. And I wanna get that into RDS, maybe it is a migration, but it also could be a, I wanna leverage that data. I wanna make sure that my developers are, are exploring what it needs to look like from an RDS point of view before we do that migration. I wanna leverage that copy of data to do something. Uh, and production's not gonna change as well. There's, a, there's several use cases here, whether it's migration or cloning or leveraging that data. So the first part of the demo is around a stable set migration to Amazon RDS. So if we look here, we have a very simple stock demo app. Um, you can see that it's made up of a front end application um, and we have our back-end database, which is a stateful set within our, within our cluster. EKS cluster, you see I've got this web front end. I've got some availability. That will become relevant later on. And you see that I've got a, a continuous chain of backups that have been happening over the part. We could do on-demand backups here and snapshots. You can see it's made up of all those, what I just showed you in the kubectl command, 
but you also hopefully saw there was a, a blueprint that's assigned to this. Now this blueprint is going to leverage PG dump to take a copy of that data and send that to our object storage. And that's going to be in a, a consi application consistent state. So we're not directly pulling the power cable out. A couple of commands, how do we, how do we make that happen? How do we orchestrate that, that PG dump to, to work against our workload? And I'm going to run that so that we've got a good, good clean backup of our, of our data. I've been running this for months, let's say, and I, I have a, a good copy of that. Now, when it comes to restore as part of that blueprint, that's what's going to send us into this reinvent RDS import database that I have. And if I jump into the terminal again, jump over, you'll see with a slash L, you'll see that I don't have a database called stock. That's the important data, and that's what I want to get into our RDS. So yes, could I just use PG dump and PG restore to do this? Yes, we know scalability issues with that, but I can orchestrate that with our tool that's already protecting the whole application. So that's the important part here. Um, I mean, every, there's a lot of people still using scripts to do backups. Now, does that make it scalable and usable? I would argue no. So in S3, we have our um, our application metadata and our PVCs all protected in here in, in uh, chunks of data. But then we also, in the PG underscore backups folder, is we basically have a PG dump of our, of our database. Obviously, I expect this to be very tiny because I wanted to be able to show it in less than five minutes. But the same process will apply for larger, larger data sets. So there's the dump. OK, so we've got a good backup of that. And now from a restore point of view, restore is what I, I'm going to use to restore that into RDS at this point. So we can use all of our existing options, all of those artifacts. Now, I'm being lazy here because I don't need the staple set, but I'm gonna, there's a purpose for that, what, what I'm going to show you um, shortly as well. You can see that our backup location for our, our dump is, is, uh, is noted down in the bottom there as well. So we're going to restore everything, just a quick and easy way just to get the demo done. Now, what I'm going to show next is what we could do to reconnect that application to using those transforms. But I'm going to manually do that because I want to show you what I'm actually, or how I'm connecting our app to our, our newly migrated RDS instance. So I hit that restore. You see that it's now starting. Again, I showed you what that looks like from a, from a uh, I connected to RDS. I showed you that there was no database in there. You can see already that it is there, and, and we obviously it's a very small data set, so we didn't have to wait around for long. And just to confirm that we have that now, you're going to see what we saw on the front end web application, for example, if I do a select star from stock. Very simple, but ultimately what we just did was orchestrated the migration of Postgres from a stateful set into RDS. OK, so, but our our web front end is still pointing to the local, the staple set. So we need to change that. Now, I, these next three files or artifacts, YAML manifest that I'm going to now push into my cluster, I'm actually going, I, I could use our transform, transform sets to be able to automate this as part of that recovery process. So I'm going to create a config map that's going to connect my front end application to our RDS database. I'm going to create a secret that is also going to give us authentication into. The key part as well here is that I've already created the IAM role that gives me the RDS capability of being able to then um, take those, those snapshots as well. And then I'm going to change the deployment to use that new config map as well. So those three things, I'm changing the deployment. That's why that, that warning comes up as well. Um, and with that, we, our front end will now be connected to our RDS versus anything local. So if we look at those pods, uh, yeah, I, I used the wrong name, and I didn't have chance on the on the plane over to to modify the demo um, again. So I uh, I continued. I made that change to the deployment and fixed that quickly, and we're back up and running. We've been up for six seconds. So now, if I go and report forward our application, then we'll see the same data that we saw in the database. But I'm not expecting you to trust what I'm doing, so let's make some changes to our stock, stock numbers and then prove that I am actually using the RDS instance for this. 
So we're going to just random numbers just to show some stock changing. And then the bit that I haven't included in this, so once now, now we're our front end web application that is living in our Kubernetes cluster and our backup, oh, sorry, our database is in RDS. We have then the ability to use a blueprint to protect the whole application. Now, I didn't want to make that a 12 minute demo, so I left that bit out, but I'll be doing a demo later on today on the Kasten booth where we literally go from, from that staple set to RDS and protecting it. Um, later on. So there you go. Hopefully you were watching that as well, is that I'm on the RDS. I've just done that simple select um, from that, that database. And you can see that it's obviously using, using that, um, that database. So from an enterprise scale point of view, and I'm going to get Mark back up in a, in a second to, to kind of touch on this. Deployment scales are growing. We're seeing not necessarily Kubernetes applications or an application per Kubernetes cluster. Some, some people are doing that, but it's tends to be smaller Kubernetes clusters versus gigantic one cluster rules all of our applications. So we're seeing that, and that, that brings us on to why we've, um, why we've done some of the stuff that, that Mark's going to cover later on. We're also seeing that continuation of the, the diversity of databases and where they run, those patterns that I mentioned right at the start, whether it be PaaS-based services or whether it be actually in, in cluster. And we're seeing different workloads as well. One of the things that I was impressed with at, at KubeCon a couple of weeks ago in Chicago was how Kubernetes isn't just container orchestration. We're seeing operators that spin up MongoDB Atlas type PaaS workloads. We're seeing um, VMs being managed by Kubernetes, OpenShift virtualization, VMware are doing something similar. So being able to run virtual machines in that re Kubernetes reconciliation loop as well. So I think that's quite interesting to where we're going and, and how Kubernetes is not just a um, container orchestration engine, it's, a, it's a, a, an ever-growing ecosystem of, of different tools. So obviously we don't just make this up, we look at the industry um, trends around things like the CNCF, so the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and if your organization, they asked um, a, a group of people, if your organization uses Kubernetes, how many production clusters do you have? And if you compare this to last year, this is definitely growing as well. Um, it would have probably been good to, to put that on there as well. But you can see that that 10 plus clusters is, is, is a, a large amount of what that, what that number of people reported back. The other thing that we found, and this is the 6.5 release that actually came out on Monday of this week, which is a combined uh, like everything I've spoken about and some, some more stuff um, over the last six months, say, is, is, is all in there. But this is, I wanted to bring this up, is when it comes to restoring pre-6.5, we would have to go through in each individual app and we'd have to restore each one individually. What this gives us the ability to do is actually select multiple applications and tell it to restore all of them at once. So when it comes to things like disaster recovery, this really does speed up that, that process. Um, bulk migrations as well, like I just, like I just showed. Um, you can pick a time range and you can do that multi-application restore. You can transform what they look like as well. So if you're going all into a new, new storage layer, then you can manipulate what that looks like as it, as it goes through. So quite a flexible way of being able to not only recover, but also migrate and clone those workloads for other use cases, leveraging that data. And I guess I'll, I'll, I'll open this up before bringing Mark back on to, to walk through the rest of this is we've had the, so every, every cluster that you have, K10 gets deployed. We have a Helm chart. We're in some of the marketplaces as well. So you, I, if I've got 10 plus clusters, I don't want to go to each individual cluster and set up my backup policies. I want a view of all of them. Now, pre-6.5, without stealing Mark's thunder, we had multi-cluster. We had the ability to, to do this. But that cluster increase number was starting to, to weigh on, on some of the architecture decisions that we'd made. So we refactored what that needed to look like, whilst also making other changes. Some clusters, they come up, they go down, but they do have important data on. So we want to make sure that when they are up, we are protecting that data, even if they, they go away. So I think with that, Mark, I think it's probably probably good for you to walk through the uh, the multi-cluster stuff. 
Thank you, Michael. So as I mentioned earlier, I am Mark Severson. I've been the tech lead on our multi-cluster systems. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through how some of that works. So uh, one thing to mention before we uh, get started here, one thing that's been important for Kasten's K10 multi-cluster system is that all the clusters can operate autonomously. We don't want one central point of failure in your systems. So every time we set up a multi-cluster system, we distribute that load out to other clusters and allow them to do the work and to maintain the backups and systems in their own clusters. And that's something that we've wanted to maintain as we have upgraded our multi-cluster system here. The communication between these clusters is also important though. We need to maintain that security as we are communicating between our clusters. Uh, we want to have a simple configuration, uh, but with our pre-6.5 offerings, there was a bit more complexity in the way that you had to go about setting those things up. Your clusters had to be able to communicate from one uh, cluster, your primary cluster, out to your secondary clusters, but now we are looking to invert that. We have those secondary clusters connecting into a single point so you only have to have your network operations open one direction now instead of that primary cluster needing to reach out to each of the other clusters. They can reach to one central point. This simplifies the way that you deploy your multi-cluster system significantly. And your operations team will very, be very happy about this. Now, we're going to look at a demo here. You can see we're... We're starting with one primary cluster I mentioned. This is going to be in EKS in uh, US East. We are also going to have a cluster in US West that's going to join that primary cluster. And we'll see how those systems connect together. Now, we want to not only do this with uh, one cluster at a time, we want to be able to do this with many clusters. Like Michael mentioned, we want to be able to deploy and manage a large number of clusters. So we're going to do that with Argo CD. So to start, we have this primary cluster that we have set up. Uh, getting a primary cluster configured and going uh, doesn't take a lot, but we still need to bootstrap a few things into that cluster to get that cluster set up. You can see we already have this cluster set up, we have a few applications that are already deployed in here, uh, and we already have K10 running here. To show you kind of how we got to this point, we want to talk, or I'm going to show you here, our bootstrap resource. Uh, this is a very simple resource. There's several different ways to set up a primary. Uh, in this case, we are using a bootstrap resource. We'll flip over to the command line here, and we'll show you, we created this bootstrap resource this goes and configures a primary cluster for us so that we can start distributing and centralizing the management of our K10 systems. So we'll describe the bootstrap that we've already performed here so that you can see that. This bootstrap uh, is part of K10. It's going through and configuring the resources the way that those need to be uh, so that K10 can manage these things. At the end of the bootstrap, we create a cluster. The cluster is what you saw in that last screenshot in the UI. We had that east primary cluster there. Uh, this is the cluster that you can see here. We have our ingress and everything set up there. This is how we are going to communicate uh, to east primary from all the rest of our clusters. So once we have all of this set up, so the, these clusters all need to be able to connect into this primary cluster. To do that, we want to be able to do that without having secrets stored in our Git, uh, GitOps systems. We don't want to be committing secrets to our source control. So we're generating a join token here. This token can be used to join any number of clusters to your multi-cluster system. So we create an empty join token here the K10 system then fills in this secret. We generate a, a unique secret, 
and we put an endpoint in here, these values can then be used to join a system. But as I mentioned, we don't want to store this in a, our GitOps system. So what we're actually going to do, we're going to take these secrets and we're going to export them into Secrets Manager. Secrets Manager will then hold on to these secrets for us and we will be able to configure our C, Argo CD system to go and query Secrets Manager in any new cluster that we bring up and pull this secret into that cluster. This gives us a nice clean way to keep our secrets out of our source control, but still accessible in all the ways that we need. So we generate, or we pull the token that's been generated out. We use our AWS CLI tool. We're gonna store this in Secrets Manager and create, or create this secret in Secrets Manager and store all the join token data in there. So we'll, we'll go over here just to make sure you don't think we're pulling smoke and mirrors here. We'll look at our Secrets Manager. You can see we have our new secret here. This secret has both the endpoint and that join token that I was mentioning down here at the bottom right there. So this join token we can now go and configure our uh, external secrets manager. External secrets manager is a component that we can install uh, to pull in a secret from secrets manager or some other uh, secrets hosting systems. We're not gonna go through how to install external secrets manager or secrets operator, but this external secrets operator is providing us a way to get that into our new clusters as those come online. So this gives us a really simple way to do that. And uh, we'll be able to configure Argo CD to deploy an external secret that then sticks in the secret that we need. So as we go through here, uh, this also is a good way, if we're trying to manage our service accounts, this gives us clean integration with EKS to get a service account provisioned into our cluster as well. Secrets Manager does that for us, the external secrets manager. So we, as I mentioned, are gonna use Argo CD to get this provisioned for us. So we've got Argo CD already running in our cluster here but we need to go and configure that. So we're gonna switch over to our source control system and we're going to get everything set up here. We're going to be using application sets. There are different ways you can uh, deploy this using Argo CD. We're going to use an application set. So we're configuring this application set so that when a particular cluster comes online with the labels here, we will be able to automatically provision things into that cluster that we need. So you can see here, we are referencing a path in our GitOps system. This path has configuration about all of the things that we need to provision there. So if we jump over and look, well, this is going to provision everything in the Cast.io namespace. So if we jump over and look at what's in this path, we have uh, K10 rendered out from our Helm chart. So standard kind of thing you might do, you render out a Helm chart that you need to install, you get a manifest file built up of all those resources that need to be there, and we can store this in our GitOps system. So this is a pre-canned version of what our system needs to look like when we install K10 into a new cluster. But as I mentioned before, we also need that join secret to make it over into this cluster. So we're going to create an external secret. As I mentioned, we already have the external secrets operator there, which we can also deploy through Argo CD. This is going to create this MC join secret that we need in our cluster. This goes and pulls from the secrets manager and creates that secret in our cluster. This join secret is what K10 is going to pick up after it's deployed with all the rest of the pieces and is going to join that primary in our multi-cluster system. So 
you can imagine we could set this all up to happen automatically as we provision new clusters so that we don't have to do this one-off. In this particular case, we just have one cluster that we're joining, so we will jump over here and join that manually here in a second. The first thing we need to do, though, is we need to get this application set set up and running in our uh, in Argo CD. So this application set is not yet running in our cluster. And we will show you that here. We'll go ahead and query all of the application sets that are currently installed. And as you can see here, there aren't any application sets just yet. So we will create the application set and get that installed into Argo CD. Okay, we have our application set. Now, now that the application set is there, we can add our cluster, our West, US West cluster. We're going to add that to Argo CD here, and that will allow us to get things going. So, flip over to our other cluster. We're gonna use Argo CD, and we will add that cluster in. And Argo CD, when it picks up that new cluster, it's going to match the labels of that cluster, just as we mentioned, and that application set's going to be provisioned into that cluster for us. So Argo CD is going to handle all of getting K10 running, the secret management, and all of that will be handled for us. So we'll flip back over to Argo CD here, and if we look at the applications, or the clusters, you can see we have our new cluster here, and if we look at our application sets, you can see Argo CD has already picked this up and is already getting all of our resources provisioned into the cluster for us. So if we look at the uh, application set here, you can see we're still in progress getting all those resources set up. The, all through our different services here, and right here, oh, scrolled too far, Right here, we can see that external secret, the MC join external secret, has been provisioned and it's already created our MC join secret, and we have a status. So we can see Argo has already gotten things running for us. So let's go look at what our status looks like really quick here. As quick as we type. Okay, so just cross-checking, we, we see all of our secrets here. We have our MC join and our status. We also have a MC cluster info. This is K10 keeping track of where our clusters are and the information that it needs to connect out to our primary cluster. So we'll look at our join status here. So our join status tells us if anything happened while we were provisioning something and our cluster didn't join properly, uh, that would all be here in our join status. You can see here we have a timestamp and a status. The status there, you'll have to trust me, says joined. It's base64 encoded. And then our timestamp is when that happened. So we're all good and healthy now. We have K10 deployed. We've got our join secret there, and K10 is joined. You can see here, the cluster has joined now, and we also have metrics. So now our K10 system is running, our multi-cluster system is running, pulling all those metrics in, collecting all that data into a single place that you can view and manage what's going on with your backups. And also we can start distributing our policies and profiles and other things to those clusters so that we can maintain a good management of what all of those systems need to look like. You can see we have policies that we can distribute. We've also got profiles. A profile is where we can store our data. So this is something that we want in most of our clusters. So we're going to go ahead and configure 
a distribution to take this profile and put it in all of our clusters that are now coming online. This is our default profile. We'll distribute this to all of our secondary clusters. And this will take with it all the credentials we need to connect to that S3 bucket. Uh, in this case, it's an immutable S3 bucket. And this allows us to store all of our backups uh, protected from ransomware, like Michael was talking about earlier. So this goes through, synchronizes that, pushes that out to all of our clusters. You can see we are in sync. And now if we go back and switch to that particular cluster, you can see that that profile is now installed into this secondary cluster. So all of your management now centralized in one place and all uh, provisioned through uh, Argo CD. So this is what we mean when we talk about massively scalable uh, multi-cluster systems. We're not just talking about a couple of clusters now. We can provision many clusters. As your clusters come up, they can automatically be joined. We distribute all of the things that we need to to these clusters, and we collect those metrics back so that we can have visibility into them all in one place. Originally, when we built a multi-cluster system, our administrator would have to go in and configure the primary cluster and the secondary cluster, the primary cluster would need to be able to connect out to the secondary cluster uh, through the API server. We would also have to configure a way to connect to K10's ingress directly as well. And you would have to do this for each of your clusters. So this turns into a lot of management at your network level between all of your clusters because each cluster needs to be open to the primary. Our new architecture instead is now based on the secondaries reaching back to the primary. So now you only have one place that you need to open in order for your clusters to be able to connect and share that information and manage those systems. Each of your secondaries connects back to the primary through a single point. And if you would like, we still provide an optional way for you to connect from the primary cluster back into the secondary clusters if you'd like to drill into those clusters and see how those clusters are doing at a more fine-grained level. So we, as we talked about before, we have a primary cluster. We are generating a join token. This join token then gets filled in by K10. This gets pulled into Secrets Manager. And then we can configure an application set that takes in our secret reference, but without storing the secret information itself, and provision that into our secondary cluster. Our secondary cluster with the external secrets operator now takes in that external secret that got provisioned by Argo for us. It tells the cluster, the cluster secrets operator goes out to secrets manager, pulls that secret back in, and we have our MC join secret, which can then be used to talk to the primary and configures our cluster so that we have our dashboard. And now we have communication between our clusters, all from this one simple deployment, keeping all of those secrets external to our, uh, to our Argo system. And now we can distribute and have all of the multi-cluster features that we are used to. So with that, I'll invite Michael back up. Cool, Mark, uh, uh, great job. Um, I think the other thing to mention there, like, so we just showed primary and one secondary. If we go back to the slide about the CNCF, seeing 10 plus clusters, we start to see like multiple secondaries in there. And what we showed, we showed a lot of the, the behind the scenes, the manual, those clusters come and we auto, that, that's an automated, uh, process that goes through that. So there's a lot of setup in there, but once it's done, and then it does inherit that, that GitOps model in, in terms of um, adding new clusters and, and removing them as well. Uh, so obviously we packed a lot into, into our session. 
Um, there's five minutes left. In terms of resources, you might have seen us over on the booth. Um, I can't remember our booth number. April probably would tell me off. What was that? 1450. 1450. You probably see us. Um, and that's really just anything general around data protection, like looking after the data, the shared responsibility model, whether it's backing up EC2 instances, whether it's backing up our containers or virtual machines inside of Kubernetes. Also, things like RDS and, and DynamoDB or other areas that we're, we're looking to, well, we are protecting with the product. There's obviously a load of links there on kasten.io and veeam.com. Um, if you go to the next slide, Mark, just to wrap things up. So, Casting K10 is obviously an enterprise solution, but it's really important from a community perspective to, to get, get hands on. And we have this community edition that allows you to have five worker nodes. So Casting K10 is, is, a, is licensed on a per worker node. So we give away five free worker nodes um, so that you can get hands on, you can play around with that. It's fully functional. You don't lose any of that, that features and functionality within that. And then if you just go to the next slide as well. Uh, again, lastly, before we wrap up, if there's any questions, me and Mark can be just out the door when we, when we leave. But please um, fill in the, the survey. It's important to us to make sure that what we're, what we're delivering is, is relevant to you guys. You obviously spent, you've spent an hour with us. Like, is it useful? Do you want to hear more? Um, and all of that good stuff so that we can shape it up. Hopefully we put a good blend of, there's a lot of slides in there, but hopefully we broke it up with a bit of demo as well. So yeah, and with that, um, I'd just like to say thank you, Mark, for, for walking everyone through the multi-cluster stuff, but also thank you guys for, for, uh, for attending the session. Thank you.